Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our discussions with each of the poems of Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We now turn to Song of Myself, passage number 22. Now we have said already in earlier lectures that section 20 through 25 is in some ways maybe a close analysis of Whitman's understanding of the mystical experience of self-awakening, as some scholars have called it, from purification to the acceptance of the physical body, and we're going to hear more about that in this one. Now, you'll remember that we've said already key lines from Song of Myself, Passage 4, both in and out of the game, and watching and wondering at it. I witness and wait. We're going to pay attention to those set of lines as it relates again to Passage 22. I have said already that there will be these echoes, these resonances that continue, and I'm hoping that I can help you to be able to find those. Uh, again, just another important line from his notebooks was that Whitman said, I stand for the sunny point of view, and that optimism will be a huge part of our reading of this as well. Now again, our assumption is you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, find our Talks with Walt playlist. My hope is that you've already worked with us for the 24 poems of inscriptions, the 19 sections of starting from Palmanach, central, especially passage 7 from that one, and then finally Song of Myself from the intro through passage 21. Just to remind you, at the conclusion of 21, uh, the, the lines uh, were, were, of course, graphic and radical, as we said. Smile for your lover comes. We're going to have more of the sexual language coming in passage 22. Prodigal, you have given me love, therefore I to you give love. Oh, unspeakable, passionate love. And that's how, th that's how that passage ends. And then in the original 1855, which by the way, by the deathbed edition, Two different sets of lines will have been removed from this, and we'll point those out as we go. He continues then with, um, in the 55 edition, seven times we'll have more exclamation marks. They will have been, been, been edited out. You can count them as we go. Uh, U C S E A with the exclamation point. I resign myself to you also. I guess what you mean. I behold from the beach your crooked, inviting fingers. I believe you refuse to go back without feeling of me. We must have a turn together. I undress, hurry me out of sight of the land, cushion me soft, rock me in billowy drowse, dash me with amorous wet. I can repay you. Um, now, let's just remind ourselves of the, of the lines from Child Harold's Pilgrimage, Byron's classic, apostrophe to the ocean. We've given a set of, uh, of comments on this already. Do you remember at the conclusion of that, and I have loved the ocean, and my joy of youthful sports was on thy breast to be born like thy bubbles onward from a boy I wantoned with thy breakers. They to me were a delight, and if the freeze, if the freshening sea made them a terror, t'was a pleasing terror, uh, a pleasing fear, for I was as it were a child of thee, and trusted to thy billows far and near, and laid my hand upon thy mane, as I do here, from 1812. So you can already get a sense that Whitman is playing the Byron game. I would put that in our notes at 3A. Certainly the game is being played. Let's just work through these opening lines quickly. Notice he says to the sea, I resign myself to you also. That is to say, I'm giving up myself to you. And again, the key symbols of Song of Myself are in fact earth and sea, and so water. Well, again, we'll see these both joined together powerfully in passage 46-47 of Song of Myself. I guess what you mean. Now this guessing, again, takes us to the fallibilist position epistemologically. And then, I behold from the beach your crooked inviting fingers. Now the use of this word behold will make us think about Wordsworth's my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. We've given full comments on that at Learn Strong as well. Notice crooked, inviting fingers. This is the language, in some ways, of the prostitute that we met earlier with the, with the pimpling neck, inviting the lover, or just someone inviting. The word, the, the use of the word crooked is a fascinating adjective for inviting fingers. I believe you refuse to go back without feeling of me. Again, this love language, this very sexual language. We must have a turn together. Now, Whitman's audience knew exactly the game that was being played in language like this, but he's talking 
to the sea. He's talking to the ocean. Quite remarkable. I undress, which will sound very much like passages 2 and 5 already that we have studied of Song of Myself. Hurry me. That's that urge, that procreant urge. I told you that we'll, we'll constantly see this one. Out of sight of the land. In other words, whatever it is we're going to do together, the land doesn't need to see. Cushion me soft. Rock me in billowy drowse, and of course, all of this, all of this language is sexual, and of course, it's going to disturb a good number of people. Dash me with amorous wet. We're going to hear this word dash at the conclusion of 46, 47, when he talks about swimming in the ocean. Of course, Whitman himself loved to bathe was the word of the day, but it just means swimming in the ocean. Dash me with amorous wet, again, all of the sexual language, I can repay you. Then we have a series of lines, uh, anaphoria, where the word see is going to be repeated uh, three times and then four at the conclusion, at the conclusion line. Sea of set of stretched ground swells, sea breathing broad and convulsive breaths. By the way, in the 1855, all of these had exclamation points after all of them. Now this thing about, uh, notice just the genius of, of Whitman. He'll say, see, breathing broad and convulsive breaths. Let's make two quick observations. Broad. And, and again, this is the power of those echoes. My words echo thus in your mind is the way that T.S. Eliot will say it in Burt Norton's opening lines. There's this echo. Wait a minute, where have I heard broad before? Oh yeah, he used this when he was talking in passage 6 of broad zones. So you can go back and play that game. Convulsive breaths. It's beautiful the way that Whitman loves to do this. Let me point this out to you. He loves these adjectives that can be at the same time negative and positive. Convulsive, both negative as well as positive, right? See, of the brine of life and of unshoveled yet always ready graves. Of course, here we are back to passage 6 again, right? Um, the, the uncut hair of graves and all of that. Howler and scooper of storms. Of course, we know all about the power of the word howl as it relates to the great Ginsburg and his poem Howl, right? Just pay attention to the way that the word howl gets used in, in Leaves of Grass. Capricious and dainty sea, the personification, of course, of the sea almost as a lover, of, uh, as a woman. And then he finally says it, I am integral with you. I, too, am of one phase and of all phases. Now, I've already commented on the fact that I believe that Whitman is the great integral voice of American poetry, borrowing heavily, of course, from Emerson and Thoreau, no question, so that by the time we get to, uh, to uh, Ken Wilber's integral perspective, as we'll call, comment on it here at the end, we know so much of it is, is born here. Now this integral philosophy, Henry James, many have argued in varieties of religious exper experience, also playing the game of the integral. In other words, that somehow the capacity that Whitman has to say, I am you and you are me, every atom belonging to me as well belongs to you, as he will say, of one phase and all phases somehow Susumi. And it will be Whitman, and I think this is why we read Whitman today, who will challenge us as Americans and then lovers of this world to try to see all the perspectives. Remember what he said earlier in passage two about somehow being able to filter it all through yourself, and I think this is huge. Then he will say, partaker of influx and efflux, we're back to our Darwin, I, extoller of hate and conciliation, extoller of amis, this French word for lovers, and those that sleep in each other's arms. We're back to the bedfellow of passage three. In other words, you'll remember what he said in, st in starting from Pominach passage number five, and his whole notion of, uh, of, of omnes, of all, that idea of being the all as well as all. All of this is, is played out here. I am he. Attesting sympathy. By the way, notice this extoller used twice and then attesting. It's very prophetic, prophet-like language, right? I am he, attesting sympathy, right? Compassion. Adhesiveness will be the other term for it. And then he puts this in parenthetics, although not in the 1855, in parenthetics. Shall I make my list of things in the house and skip the house that supports them? That... Very, he loves these rhetorical questions. Again, as we've pointed out, we're going to see several more of them. This is that house idea of castles in the air from Thoreau's, uh, from, for, from Thoreau's Walden. And then we will have the first of a couple of missing lines that will run like this. I am the poet of common sense and of the demonstrable and of 
immortality. Now, why he would choose to live a set of lines out like that, I'll, I'll leave to you to decide. And then he continues, and I am, it, it, originally in 55, it was the word and, I am not the poet of goodness only. I do not decline to be the poet of wickedness also. Now, this will remind us of our study of Emerson, no question. It will remind us of starting from Pomenoc passage number 7. Go back to our comments there to be reminded of what we say there. And then we'll have another edited outline, uh, which is bizarre. Washes and razors for foo-foos. You know, fools or ninnies. It's that, again, as opposed to that more masculine language. For me, Freckles and a bristling beard. Now we saw this already before when he start, when he talks about the you know the gray neck and all of that, and of course we're mentioning beards. Although again this edited outline, and then he asks, what blurt is this about virtue and about vice? This word blurt is a fun word because it's a journalism word, but it also will reference, of course, the idea of who it is that might be standing in a pulpit and blurting out. Right? He says, evil propels me. And reform of evil propels me. I stand indifferent. My gate is no fault finders or rejecters gate. I moisten the roots of all that has grown. Now let's pause for a moment and point out that this idea about evil propels me and reform of evil also, um, uh, reform of evil propels me. I stand indifferent. Two observations. There is great debate among scholars about the degree to which Whitman was influenced by the great Hegel. And we've given lectures on Hegel, of course, that thesis antithesis which resolves itself into, th into synthesis. And the ways in which there's a search for a certain kind of integral balance between good and evil. We can think, of course, of our comments on, Bl on uh, William Blake as well, right? No, songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience. When he says, I stand indifferent, we're going to meet this again in the poem, I sit and look out. The last lines are, I sit, I see, hear, and am silent. There's a certain kind of like, I'm just reporting information, I'm not passing judgment, is maybe a way to say it. Then he uses the language of walking, makes us think of Song of the Open Road. My gate is no fault finders or rejecters gate. This will be his problem with m much of organized religion. Cre uh, creeds and schools in abeyance, he will say in, in passage one. I moisten the roots of all that has grown. Go back to passage five and his comments about pokeweed. And then he asks more of this interesting uh, use of the rhetorical question. Did you fear some scrofula, that is to say, almost like tuberculosis, some inflammation, out of the unflagging pregnancy? In other words, did you have fear of the future? Did you guess the celestial laws? Of course, the word laws getting used in this way makes us think of Emerson, are yet to be worked over and rectified. In other words, were you afraid of the potentiality of the future? I, and then we'll, we'll have some one last set of missing lines. He says, I step up to say that what we do is right and what we affirm is right and some is only the or of right. And then he says, witness of us, one side a balance, and the antipodal side a balance. And then we'll come back to it. This idea of the balancing that many have, have said probably is derived from his understanding of Hegel, right? That is to say, I find one side a balance and the antipodal side a balance. In other words, always looking for some sense of harmony or balance. Soft doctrine as steady help as stable doctrine. Now, what's going on with this doctrine? We're back, of course, to creeds and schools and abands. Notice we got soft versus stable doctrine. In other words, we've got two sides. By the way, the word soft here means not as dogmatic, right, as maybe stable will be orthodoxy, we might say. Thoughts and deeds of the present our rouse and early start. And again, this, this is the language of Song of the Open Road. A foot and lighthearted I take to the open road. Healthy, free, the world before me. The long brown road before me leading wherever I choose. He finishes now this passage 22. This minute that comes to me, before it was the present, now it's this minute. This minute that comes to me over the past decillions, it, it is true that Whitman was very interested in the new science that was starting to understand through Darwin the study of the earth, the geological record, and the like, and how old is the earth, right? There is no better than it and now. Passage 46 will open. I 
No, I have the best of time and space. I was never measured and never will be measured. That notion that the very best time is this time right here, right now. Whitman's always wanting to challenge us to think in those terms. What behaved well in the past or behaves well today, the new is the new, the N-E-W is the K-N-E-W, is not such a wonder. The wonder is always and always how there can be a mean man, that is to say, an ungrateful man, or an infidel, that is to say, an unbeliever. And, of course, that's one of the more remarkable lines of Song of Myself. Whitman says, when you consider the sea, the majesty of the sea, and, of course, the earth, Everything somehow is harmonious, and to that degree, I can't imagine that anybody would not be curious about nature and would not be a believer in the force and the power of nature. Well, to finish it, 2A, of course, the interval perspective is obviously the best for Whitman. It's the one that makes the most sense for him. It's the one that's the greatest balance. At 2B, well, again, the anaphoria, the, rep the repetitions of C, and of course, all of these echoes, it's quite a remarkable thing to just sit down and start going back, wait, 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 where did I hear that before? Where did I hear that before? You're going to play that game a lot. At 3A, I'm just going to mention Ken Wilber's one more time, Marriage of Sense and Soul, and the, influ and the influence of the integral psychological and philosophic orientation and, and, and view in 303. I mean, obviously, we love that line. No human mind is capable of 100% error. Always trying to include as many points of view as possible and show respect to all points of view, even those, especially those, we don't agree with. Finally, at 3B, what leaves you with a sense of wonder? The earth, the sea, anything else. Let's move on now to passage 23, speaking of the integral model, and en masse, as he will use the phrase. I hope you're enjoying the challenge of this reading and study. Thank you.